Thank you all, and I want to make sure people can hear me because we were. Can everybody hear me in the room? Okay, great. Well, it's a very interesting night to <laughs> be out. I want to thank everyone for coming and braving the gauntlet outside, which um, it's an interesting case study. I mean, I was talking to um, Janie about this during these last few days, the, the effort to cancel this talk. And not only this talk, but every other talk that ICON would ever like to stage here um, was something of an education for all of us, I think. And I would just like to thank ICON for its support of free speech. And I would like to thank also Extraordinary Ventures for upholding its place as a, as a venue for all manner of opinion and ideas. And I would add, I live in Washington. <laughs> so, this, <laughs> so you know that in my experience, this kind of strength and courage is actually, unfortunately, quite rare. And I speak from personal experience, in fact, in, in, in various um, times and, and phases. So I, I really do commend all of you for coming out. Icon and Extraordinary Ventures. And of course, our, our topic tonight, again, it, it, you know, it could have been any other topic, but the topic is um, where did politically correct come from and what is it doing? Got it a little wrong in my beautiful slide. That's my husband's um, editing. <laughs> but I, I do like the title, where did politically correct come from and what is it doing very much? And I will tell you, that the work I did for this speech is actually new research, believe it or not. We've been living with political correctness for decades. And I would say that in both of my previous books, um, I have they're both really about the same topic. And I would say that both uh, times phases of writing, which would have been around 2004 for The Death of the Grown-Up and 2009, 10, 11, four, 12 for American Betrayal, which is a long research work, um, I've always come to a dead end. I've always come back to the idea that I don't like the term because it doesn't really tell us where did it come from. It doesn't really even tell us what it's doing. But, and yet we all, I think, know what it is. We all recognize it. We all understand when it's trying to shut us down, when it's trying to cancel a speech, when it's trying to um, extinguish, really, our, our very basic liberty. And I would just review what we went through this week in case people have not been aware of this. This is the actual or extracts from the email that came in to cancel, the request to cancel my speech and ICON's lecture series. And you can see it's, it's, it's an idea, um, somebody actually believing that they have the authority to deem what is permissible for you to choose or not to come to listen to, to enjoy it, to find it boring, to reject it, whatever it is. But this is, this is what happens when the principle of free speech is lost, or rather seized, by people with an agenda. Um, the kind of language in here, hosting such bigoted voices. Where is the authority that can call me a bigoted voice, or Icon's other lecturers, blanket, uh, demonization, negation? I mean, when you actually start thinking about what this is about, this is actually, this is actually my livelihood speaking, writing, getting a chance to try out my ideas, see if people um, want to inform me, having that, that exchange, it, it's constant. And, and this is somebody or a group of people who think that it is in their power, it is in their interest, it is in their, uh, their, their entire political makeup to make this choice, to try to shut it down because it will harm what I'm going to say will harm. I mean, this whole idea also that words can harm. I mean, this is another aspect of this that we can also recognize from this idea of political correctness, that words are offensive, words hurt, words harm, whereas we want to use words to communicate. We want to use words to uh, describe and get closer and closer to an understanding. And so this is where we get to this part where, you know, the, the idea to cancel my speech and future lecture series by ICON we look forward to working with you to build a peaceful, just, 
and loving community, which is, which I couldn't resist. <laughs> so, it's a joke and yet it's not because there is this always this effort to mask what is really going on. And I think that is, is one of the things about political correctness that is, 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 is always a great frustration. We see when this is this kind of power, I mean, this is just in a group of citizens or people with some affiliations and so on. When this power, when this attitude is in the hands of a state, we see things like banning of people from entry, for example, into the United Kingdom. We see this with uh, Pamela Geller. We see this with the Dutch parliamentarian who may become prime minister next year, Herr Wilders, and uh, Michael Savage, American talk show host, of course. Um, this kind of power to exclude, to negate, um, when we see it in the hands, just, I mean, everyone has examples. We see it in, at UVA in the last few weeks. We've seen an uh, engineering school professor suspended, taking a leave of absence for expressing himself about the Black Lives Matter movement on a Facebook page. He, he talked about it being a, a racist organization akin to the Klan, and he was expunged, at least temporarily, from being fit to appear before a classroom, and he is going to be, have to undergo some kind of counseling. I mean, this is the stuff of dictatorship in terms of trying to condition uh, what we say, what we think. Um, we've seen it in business, of course, the, the famous example of Mozilla's executive, its chief executive, stepping down. After it came out, he'd given $1,000 to Proposition 8 in California, uh, which, of course, was the anti-same-sex marriage uh, proposition a few years back. We could actually spend the whole night just all throwing in examples because we've been watching this for so many years. And I, the first thing I'd like to really ask is that we stop thinking about it as political, correct, this sort of amorphous term, that we start thinking about what it is doing, it's purging. Um, words are so important. Um, we recognize it, but we've got to come much closer to describing it. It's coercion. I mean, there was an attempt to coerce all of us not to come here. It might have happened. It's happened many, many times where venues have canceled, uh, sponsors have disappeared. This is, this is coercion. This is, an, this is an attempt to exert power. I mean, it's a very, very serious um, action. Uh, in response, we, we actually ended up with, and I'm very thankful for them, the more police protection tonight. And, and you know, I'd like to thank the officers who are here. Um, but this is the kind of, oh yes, I know. But this, this is where you realize that this is not just a debating point. This is actually naked force masquerading as something else, or at least the threat of force. Um, and certainly we've seen many actions, many instances where violence has occurred. We've seen assassination attempts. We've seen um, in Garland, Texas, of course, at the uh, Draw Muhammad contest, and so on. So many of these kinds of um, outbreaks. So I think that it's very important to understand this as an attempt to uh, politically indoctrinate people, to understand it even further as a, a tactic of psychological warfare. I mean, this is very serious. Um, even the term brainwashing is very apt. And when I was looking back at some of the um, ways in which we've seen this creep into our society. We go back to the term brainwashing, which a lot of people associate with cartoons or some kind of extreme, um, you know, made up sort of characterization. And yet it, it comes from, the term was actually brought to us, I don't know if people know this, but it was, came out in English in the 1950s from a, a truly amazing journalist named Edward Hunter. He was all over the, uh, in the Orient. He was all over Asia in uh, the run-up and during World War II, in China and Burma and, and all places. He was there during the Korean War. And he started interviewing American POWs who'd been held by North Korea and also interviewing um, Chinese who were being coerced psychologically by the communist takeover of China that in the late 1940s. And he heard them talking about this idea that if you said something in an interview or something in a conversation that, that was known to be beyond this, this correct parameter, the person would say, you better watch out, they will wash your brain. And this was the way the Chinese expressed it. And he turned that into the word brainwashing. And he actually testified before Congress several times about this in various 
um, hearings about this idea of psychological warfare against the free world. We see this kind of thing either very extremely in a prisoner situation with, with true you know, with torture and all manner of coercion. We also see this kind of conditioning, though, all around our society. Of course, these things change as they morph around our world. Um, and I was really struck some years ago, I would say in some ways it was the birth of the death of the grown-up, when I have, um, my husband and I have twin daughters. And when they were four years old, I was reading the Mary Poppins. And it was a new edition, and we came to this. This is, a, this is an illustration from a story about Mary Poppins taking her charges around the world. And they visit a polar bear, and a panda bear, and a toucan at the very bottom, and a dolphin. And I was thinking, P.L. Travers, the author of Mary Poppins, would, this book came out in 1936. She was born at the end of the Victorian Empire. I could not believe that she would look at the world and see all of these very popular environmental icons. And I actually went to the library to find an old copy of the book that had not been revised as this book was. And this is the picture that really was written. And it was Mary Poppins looking out at the world and going to the north and finding Eskimos, going to the east and finding Chi a Chinaman, going to the south or Africa, going to find out west, seeing the uh, chief wigwam. And this made a lot more sense. And, and I thought that it was actually a quite profound revision here. And this was, you know, I was looking at this maybe almost 20 years ago by now. It's a long time. But when you look at what's really going on, what has happened is her point of view is being erased. She is not allowed to think of herself as the, at the center of the world, looking out at the world in all its variety. Looking, I mean, it's a very silly chapter. It's a very silly story. So it's nothing profound here, except in the symbolism, which I think, I think is quite profound, because this is the basis of this notion of erasure, this brainwashing that we have seen coming into our society. And you know, it starts young. It certainly goes up to the college campuses, as we all know. Um, I came across this one I, I had to include today. This is, was written in 1982, and I would say that this is the culmination of a fine education. A male wasp who attended and succeeded at Choate, Yale, my alma mater, Yale Law School, and Princeton Graduate School. Slowly but surely, however, my lifelong habit of looking, listening, feeling, and thinking as honestly as possible has led me to see that white, male-dominated, Western European culture is the most destructive phenomenon in the known history of our planet. <laughs> Which is saying a lot. I think, I think that it, it's, you know, it, it's certainly, this is 1982, but we'll find, we could find the same letters written today. The college aspect of it, I think, is something to key into. Highly educated, highly brainwashed. I mean, I saw this on Twitter yesterday. And uh, I, I, over the weekend, and I had to take it. This is John Harwood looking at a poll by education. And we see education gender, non-college men, Trump plus 37. Non-college women, Trump plus four. College men, even, college women, Clinton plus six. Now, Mrs. Clinton will say, aha, we see how a fine education educates the voter to make the correct decision, whereas what I think we could also argue is we're looking at people who have not been indoctrinated to this aspect. And I think that this is not merely um, a, an expression of, of partisan politics to actually weigh this. John Harwood, of course, revealed by WikiLeaks to be a Clinton campaign fanboy, um, a product of Harvard and Duke also. It's not really the party politics, though, because the essence of the Trump candidacy has been this rejection of this notion of what is politically correct. And it's not just in terms of language choices um, or brusqueness or bluntness. It is what issues were taken off the table by elites of both parties that the Trump candidacy reintroduced that were themselves seen as politically incorrect. And I think this is where you see how this actually, this whole concept, which I will like to define further, 
is so powerful in that the concept of a border, the concept of a country actually wanting to have an immigration policy, the concept of uh, America first, the idea that a politician would go to the people and say, I think American interests should be first. These kinds of ideas had been eradicated from political discourse. No one, I would say since the middle of the last century, was pushing this kind of idea of America first. Everything was international, everything was global, the move toward borderless world of both parties has been steady, incessant, and in some ways um, overwhelming. Because I think when, when Trump poked his head up and started with these ideas, it was revolutionary. There was something very revolutionary about speaking them. And I say that partly as, as um, I, you know, I've, I've worked in newspapers and, and run a column for many years. I don't write my column anymore, but I only stopped a couple of years ago. And so it was going across the country, and I would get a lot of feedback. And I will say that even though there was good feedback on some of these issues, I didn't even know some of these issues myself to get involved in. But on some of them, Islam is another one, um, speaking of our protest. There was nobody in Washington or in any other centers of power that would have these kinds of conversations that even I might broach in my column. And there was no real effect. I mean, it, it's, it, and I don't even think it's, it's a, a function of how big or small my column was. It was it's the kind of, of marginal discussion that um, does, goes nowhere unless a figure of national charisma, importance, command, whatever you want to call it, someone who has a national, um, a national attention, unless someone of that, of that caliber of, of, of dissemination of, of information and, and, and such, these ideas sort of just stay out there and they're okay and people can sort of, you know, argue about them maybe, but they basically are ignored. And that was essentially what the, the people, the politically correct establishment had been able to control for about 50 years anyway, probably more, but just in terms of really controlling what issues we would go to the ballot box on. This is a brand new set of issues. And, and it's, it, it's, it's, it's an amazing uh, moment. Um, so you wonder how this can possibly even happen. How can we get to a place where this kind of um, silencing it becomes so routine, such, so much a part of our mechanism? And I um, was very taken, I've, I've been very taken for some time by uh, something that Arthur Kessler, a fa very famous ex-communist, he was very involved communist, he became an ex-communist, he wrote the very famous and remarkable novel, Darkness of, of, at Noon, of course. He also contributed an essay that I'd like to quote from a collection of essays, very famous, The God That Failed, came out in 1949, and it's a collection of essays by anti-communists. And he's writing about a conversation he had when he was early in his communist, communist career with Edgar, a man named Edgar, in quotation marks, his, co his party contact, his handler. And they're discussing um, the front page of a communist newspaper. And Kessler says, but every word on the front page is contradicted by the facts, which sounds a lot like the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> he writes, Edgar gave me a tolerant smile. You still have the mechanistic outlook, he said, and then proceeded to give me the dialectical interpretation of the facts, the Marxist interpretation. So Kessler says, gradually I learned to distrust my, mechanic, my mechanistic preoccupation with facts and to regard the world around me in the light of dialectical interpretation. It was a satisfactory and indeed blissful state. Once you had assimilated the technique, you were no longer disturbed by the facts. <laughs> Which is such a great quote, I'll put it up again. It's an amazing thing, but that does describe what we see and call political correctness. This is Marxism. Marxism controls your interpretation by controlling the language and by making the language comport to some Marxist, they call it dialectical, that word that sort of makes your eyes blur, but it, it's essentially a way of controlling thought by controlling language, which is exactly what we today will call or think of as political correctness. 
but it's really right out of the Marxist playbook, which goes, it's not just Alinskyism, which is another word that I find confusing. Alinsky was a Marxist, he was a Leninist. It, these are the same tactics that have been going on for a very long time, back into the 19th century, uh, earlier, but you know we can really look at Marx's manifesto of 1848 and start tracking things basically from there uh, for convenience sake anyway. But this is the same kind of learning that you could say is going on on our campuses, in our kindergartens, in our politics. And it's also really the basis of, of totalitarian horrors. I mean, this is, this is how it, it begins, when you can ignore the facts, when you can, the mechanism becomes more important than really what's going on, more important than the people, etc. cetera, um, which is, brings me to another quotation that I've always liked for some time, um, which is from Alain Bessesson, who very famously wrote a book called A Century of Horrors, Communism, Nazism, and the Uniqueness of the Shoah. And here he's, he's sort of elaborating, I think, on this same idea. When you accept the language of, of ideology, excuse me, the language of ideology, a person allows his mental world and his sense of self-respect to be hijacked along with the language. So you're sort of checking your, your mind at the door when you accept this language. And I think this is very interesting because he says no matter how inadvertently he may have stumbled into the use of the official vocabulary, he is now part of the ideology. People very often are polite. They don't want to make trouble. They want to get along, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so I think it's a very natural thing for a lot of us, all, from time to time, all of us probably to fall into this. But it's a, it's you know, as long as it's 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 when it becomes habitual, I think it does become a trap. You are part of the ideology, and he goes on to say, in a manner of speaking, entered into a pact with the devil. Um, I think this is also getting to the basis of Marxism as well, because the basis here is the destruction of the pursuit of truth, the destruction of absolutes, which leads to the destruction, certainly, it, it, of religion, of morality. It does, it's no longer possible when you enter into this idea, ideology. And this is where you see in terms of our understanding of it, there's so many words that will splinter this understanding. Alinskyism, progressivism, um, these kinds of, of terms, political correctness even, that I think, again, take us away from the root, which is this notion of destroying absolutes, destroying religion, destroying the tradition, no matter what you call it. And so the question becomes, as part of my, my task, where did this come from? And in terms of, we can say, oh, Marxism, but, but that doesn't tell you how it got here. How did it get so w widespread that we have this kind of effort to shut down speech? We have the, all the things we, we can think of in terms of uh, the demonization, the negation, and so on that is routine now in whatever sphere, business, education, um, film, etc. It's, it's all around, certainly politics. So how did it get mechanized? How did it get deployed here? And I think that becomes a really interesting um, story. And I will say that the conventional wisdom, among, especially among conservatives, the left calls this a conspiracy theory, but the, they call it anything a conspiracy theory, but the, but the conventional wisdom is, and this is something that really came up in the last decade, decade and a half, I would say. And it was something I didn't find when I was first looking. Um, I came to this a little later, and I'll tell you what I think of it. But the, the conventional wisdom is that something called the Frankfurt School in 1923 came together, a bunch of uh, German-Jewish, mainly German-Jewish Marxist intellectuals who learned very quickly not to describe themselves as Marxists, but they were, and upset about the failure of the Russian Revolution to ignite across Europe, to see proletariats, uh, workers of the world uniting, essentially, after the, the Bolsheviks came to power, um, determined that it was wrong to push economic Marxism, that the working classes would not, oh, excuse me, would not be interested, and that they needed to take a different tack to destroy the resolve of the working classes, and that would that would mean that they would work in a cultural way against the traditional world, and this becomes cultural Marxism. Um, when Hitler comes to power in the 1930s, these same mainly Jew German Jewish intellectuals come to America and get jobs at Columbia, elsewhere, and essentially seed this, this what's called critical theory, 
throughout academia, and we end up with the 60s. And that's kind of the way a lot of people understand this. Now, this, I'm not saying this isn't true. I'm not saying this didn't happen. But what I will tell you and try to, to demonstrate, or at least argue, is that this is just a fractional piece of the story because it presupposes that everything was A-OK -okay before they got here, that nothing had changed, that there were uh, no other networks at work in education, in politics, in religion, in labor, in schools, in theater, etc., doing the same kind of subversive work. This is kind of a, a new iteration of American Betrayal, which is um, a work that goes into what was going on, particularly in the 1930s and 40s, inside Washington with the entry of ideological communists and Soviet agents very heavily clustered inside the Roosevelt administration and how that affected our foreign policy, how I argue essentially America, Britain was also similarly infiltrated, so was Germany and Japan, el everywhere really. There was a tremendous uh, effort by, this, by Soviet intelligence to essentially try to influence how the world was uh, fighting its war and settling, settling the spoils essentially cat's paws in, in, in many ways, in many respects, of, of uh, Stalin. And when you look at this, for example, if we're going to really talk about political correctness, where we mostly see it in education, what was happening before the Frankfurt School ever got here essentially made it a, 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 a fertile field for whatever new ideas or new techniques or new uh, fronts in the same war that they d were able to develop. So I would just like to talk about that a little bit. Um, the idea that before the Frankfurt School we were only looking at economic Marxism and after, it's, it's not that simplistic, but the after it was all cultural, I think also really, really makes us forget how Marxism started as a, 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 an ideology against religion. And I have a really gruesome picture to show you um, from a Russian anti-religious communist weekly that I can only date to before 1924. The, the, the uh, weekly is called The Godless, and it's, it's a really gruesome picture um, that is actually a huge attack on Christianity. But it just, it just shows you this horrifying image, um, just ghastly image, but essentially a very crude attack on religion that, of course, is part and parcel of Marxism. Um, before we see anything happening here in terms of, of the cultural Marxists. Um, you have Marx's associate, Frederick Engels, in 1880s writing a book, um, a very influential book, to this day even, about, um, it's called The Origin of the Family. It's an attack on the nuclear family in the 1880s, the, the uh, uh, subjugation of women in the, in the, same, in the same work, uh, the oppression of women. These ideas were already part and parcel of the Marxist assault on, on everything. Um, it's, it was just prevalent. So there was no bifurcation here. Um, and it's, it's not to suggest that these people didn't do their work, but it's sort of like their new openings as the bastions fall, essentially. And I think it's very important to get an idea of this as a continuum. This is a very long continu continuum. It's very interconnected. And I found some very unusual connections that I'd like to share with you that I was not aware of before this. Because you're looking at communism and socialism both have the same goals. The main difference is socialism's uh, more gentle approach or theoretically gentle approach. Communism, you're more likely to find out and out revolutionaries and violence and so on. Not always, but this is kind of the way we usually think of it. But their goals are the same. And they're all based on Marx's manifesto. So you, that's one thing I think has become a bit separated in our minds over the years. Um, so if we go back and take a look at the Frankfurt School, which is our, our touchstone for a lot of this, even, even if it was um, not the only um, vector, you see this collection of Marxist communists. Some were party uh, under Moscow's discipline. Some were part of uh, the whole Comintern network, even in the KGB which I think is something we have to start understanding. Just as in American Betrayal, we see the KGB controlling 
officials in, this, in the Roosevelt administration and the Truman administration and beyond, um, we have to start understanding that even in the infiltration of our education system, we also have communist agents, Soviet agents. This would be, uh, for example, at the very beginning, uh, a man named Richard Sorga was in at the very beginning of the Frankfurt School. He is the Soviet Union's, one of their best spies ever. He's buried in the Kremlin Wall for his actions in the 1930s to bring Japan and the United States to, to the point of war at Pearl Harbor. That's one of his big successes. While he was working in a tremendously sophisticated cell in Tokyo, uh, with many Japanese um, affiliates. In Washington, we had Harry Dexter White, one of the top officials at the Treasury Department during the Roosevelt administration, doing the same thing in his way, trying to bring the United States and Japan to war at Pearl Harbor, successful. Um, Sorga was at the very first of the Frankfurt School. What's also interesting to note, and this was kind of an interesting connection, Marx's associate, there was a man named Friedrich Sorga back in the 1870s that Marx sent to New York City to open up the first international. Well, that's either his grandfather, the grandfather of Richard, or the great uncle, which is kind of shows you how these things are interconnected, how they go across generations. This, this is kind of where you start seeing the um, synergy here that I think has been uh, lost to us. I don't think, you know, these are not easy connections to make because the archives, the, the books, the people who would talk about these things in, in olden days, it, it's, they're over. It's, you know, it's not there in our, what we know, you know, what our collective understanding is. So we have this. We also have um, a woman named Hedda Massing who actually married three members of the Fra Frankfurt School at different times. <laughs> and uh, she was a Soviet agent. And what's, what's really interesting about her is uh, first, her first husband was a man named Hans Eisler. His brother was the top common turn agent in the United States in the 1930s. So it's very close. You see this kind of closeness. Um, her next husband, a man named Gumpertz, was very instrumental in helping get the Frankfurt School in exile into Columbia, some of, of you know, kind of moving them into the Columbia orbit. And uh, her third husband, Paul Massing, was also a Soviet agent. And just to complete this, I mean, these things can start, you really kind of need a gigantic 3D <laughs> spreadsheet for this stuff. But her, her uh, she is responsible for recruiting a Soviet agent inside the State Department named uh, Lawrence Duggan. And Lawrence Duggan is a man, you may remember his name. He committed suicide or was killed uh, as the FBI was closing in on him. And I, I'm, I'm not sure of the year, but I would, it was definitely in the late 40s or probably in the late 1940s, around 1950 at the latest, I think. But um, his, his father was on the board of the Frankfurt School in America. So you just see this kind of synergy here that I think really needs more investigation. Um, the very famous, uh, probably the most famous Frankfurt member is Herbert Marcuse who was a guru in the 1960s to the student revolutionaries, um, very much about the sexual revolution and supporting the insurrections on the campuses and all of that. Um, his very close friend, Franz Neumann, also in the Frankfurt School, was during World War II with Marcuse, Neumann, and another member of the school, a um, man named Kirchheimer. Neum Neumann was under KGB discipline during his time in the OSS, the precursor to the CIA, during World War II. He was on the German desk, and he was reporting to a Soviet NKVD or KGB officer in Washington named Elizabeth Zarobina. Her husband was the third secretary at the Soviet embassy, and he was the top agent at that time in the United States, running at that time what would become the uh, Soviet assault on our atomic secrets. So this is the kind of milieu you're looking at. That's Franz Neumann. Was Marcuse a Soviet agent? Well, you know, you look at what this work was in terms of destroying um, our fabric, our, our institutions, e criticizing everything is one way of looking at that school of critical theory, which is really a form of Marxism. I mean, again, the words, the, they're sort of like this brown paper packaging that keep us from the Marxist um, identity. Um, they, they were consistently silent on all, this, all the crimes of the Soviet Union, the gulag, the uh, purges, the show trials, the, the 
terror famine, these kinds of things. They were silent on that as they were critiquing American capitalism. So that suggests where their sympathies lies and how they were not after truth or a new way of thinking. They were, they were ideological agents. Um, the KGB was aware of, of Marcuse and in, oh, I guess 2009, we see in some KGB archives known as the Basilia of Notebooks, you see him mentioned. They're interested in him. They know he's a friend of Franz Neumann and they know that he was a communist back in Germany, a party member. There's no more, uh, there's no more paper trail than that, but you know, you're looking at this, you're thinking this is the same kind of milieu. It's not just radicals, there's also a, a driving uh, vector coming out of Moscow. So if it's not the Frankfurt School, if they are just another poisonous vessel what really came here that would have, uh, for example, created these Soviet agents who entered the Roosevelt administration, many of whom went to Harvard. Harvard's very big in this um, story. And were out by 1930. They were out of the law school by 1930. If the Frankfurt School isn't here, what was going on up to 1930 that would create these full-fledged socialists, if not Soviet agents, coming into the government? And here is something that uh, I think is, is kind of a bit of lost history, which is the 1905 founding in New York City of a group called, a socialist group called the Intercollegiate Socialist Society. This was a very big deal because the people in it were some of the best um, writers and, and thinkers at the time, Jack London, Upton Sinclair, um, a number of, of you know, sort of professional socialists, a number of communist party members as well. Uh, William Z. Foster, who would become the um, Communist Party chairman in the United States later, um, and a woman named Ella Bloor, whose son would later be a big Soviet agent in the Agriculture Department organizing the Ware Cell, which is where Whitaker Chambers was working as a Soviet agent in the 1930s. So again, these connections, you just can't ignore them. They're there um, in these movements of ideological attack on, in this case, specifically designed to go to the college campuses of America and popularize socialist ideas. So this is the purpose of this group, which was around throughout the century, the, the 20th century. Um, they had speaking tours. They set up chapters everywhere. Uh, they changed their name to the League of Industrial Democracy, which they were known for many decades. And in the 1960s, they changed again to Students for a Democratic Society. Everybody, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> SDS. So these have, you know, that just didn't erupt. This is a long continuum. Um, just mentioning as an aside, I mentioned Harvard's a big part of this. We look at the Ware group, the, the, the many, many Harvard graduates in this Soviet cell. Alger Hiss, Nathan Witt, Lee Pressman, John Apt, Henry Collins, Harry Dexter White, I mentioned earlier, and another Soviet agent, in the White House. Lachlan Curry were also teachers at Harvard. Um, there are many others I could name. Their names are kind of unfamiliar to us, but they were also agents coming out of this same milieu. So if that was going on on our colleges from 1905 and earlier, but you know, organized, really organized, where did that come from? So now we get to what I think is a really important um, group that I did not, I had been told, oh, you should look into the Fabian Society. The Fabian Society, I don't know if they'll be very familiar to people, but I'm going to put up a beautiful picture now. This is the stained glass of the Fabian, the Fabian Socialist window. The Fabian Society was founded in Britain, small group, uh, socialist, communist, Marxist, the thing that's fascinating about them is they were all very either middle class or very upper crust. They were brilliant writers. They were erudite, charming, well-dressed, often wealthy. They were committed to the stealthy dissemination of Marxism throughout British society. And they had a big Anglo-American um, exchange. There were, there were Americans early on. They, lecture, they would go to Harvard and lecture. They founded the London School of Economics, which was founded as a socialist institution. It still is, but we don't think of it that way necessarily. Um, they were successful to an a startling degree. And they're, I just want to ta point out a couple of things here. What we're looking at, maybe I'll take this off for a sec. Um, oops, what we're looking at here, this, this is George Bernard Shaw, who's one of the most important, you know, the 
famous playwright, My Fair Lady, etc., Pygmalion, of course, originally, and many other famous plays. Um, a huge Soviet apologist, but also a leading Fabian. This is Sidney Webb, who was a very important socialist Marxist. This is their secretary, not as important, but he's operating the bellows. And if you see what they're doing here, they are taking hammer and tongs to the world. And it says, pray devoutly, hammer stoutly, remold it nearer to the heart's desire. And what they're remolding is the world. They are changing the world and their coat of arms, Fabian's FS, Fabian Society, is a wolf in sheep's clothing. I have a close up on that actually. It really is. You can see the little sheep head. And the, they, these are some of the prompt. This is H.G. Wells, famous author, and some of the other members. One of my favorite children's writers, Edith Nesbitt, is in here, one of these. This is Beatrice Webb, who was a Canadian railroad heiress that funded a lot of it. And this stack of books are their tracts. And it's worth mentioning, uh, one of them is called Trade Unionism and I think that's the one. Trade Unionism was by Sidney Webb, translated into Russian by Lenin. Lenin in exile in the 1890s in England, I think he was in England, he might have been elsewhere, but he was certainly there sometimes, translated it. There was great synergy between the Fabians and the Bolsheviks, what became the, 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 the Bolsheviks that took over, the, uh, took over Russia. And this was kind of an amazing thing because these are supposed to be these very parlor, uh, ready, erudite gentlemen and gentle ladies, uh, and yet they are consorting with the most hardcore Bolsheviks that there are right from the start. In fact, they were patrons of Lenin. In 1907, Lenin and Trotsky, etc., were trying to have a revolutionary conference in Denmark, and they got thrown out. They went to England, and the Fabians were able to get them space for their conference, and an American Fabian by the name of Joseph Fells, who is the uh, soap magnate. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Na uh, Fells Nap the Soap. Big Fabian, big revolutionary angel of, of radical groups. He gave them a huge sum of money at the time. And I was thinking, Joseph Fells, Joseph Fells, where do I know that name? And it turns out that a, a couple that was very close to the Fells, in fact, he gave them money as well, had a child, a boy, they named Joseph Fells Barnes. Joseph Fels Barnes was a very top-notch Soviet agent working inside the Roosevelt administration in the 1940s. Um, in the Office of War Information, he was a very successful noted journalist. Um, he was an editor at Simon & Schuster. I mean, this is, you know, the kinds of people they come in and out of either communism, socialism, espionage. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing thing when you start kind of peeling it back. And then we come to, um, I've mentioned the Roosevelt administration a lot. Well, it's very interesting to note that the New Deal itself is a Fabian concept. In fact, a Fabian, but from Harvard, who joined the British Society, um, Stuart Chase, class of Harvard 10, 1910, wrote a book called A New Deal. And it was very much the, the, the uh, platform of the New Deal, and it was considered a Fabian uh, project. This was funded by the 20th Century Fund. The 20th Century Fund was run by a man named Evans Clark, who used to work for the Bolshevik ambassador, unofficial ambassador to the United States in the 20s. So again, you're seeing all this, these interlocking connections and relationships. It's really quite extraordinary. And I would say in brief that the uh, tax-exempt foundations are another part of this conquest of America. The uh, funding by the great foundations, Rockefeller, uh, Ford, uh, in this case 20th Century, Marshall, etc., on and on, they were funding not a lot of wonderful scientific research and, and nonpartisan research, ac pure academic research, but when it came to anything on the political side, there were hearings in the 1950s, very important hearings, because we wouldn't know any of this if they hadn't done it. They essentially funded the most leftist causes, whether it was Stuart Chase's works throughout his life, and many other works, pushing collectivism into the schools, pushing the inevitability of collectivism and socialism into the schools. And these are, these are works in the 1930s. This is, this is already going on. And I would just like to mention um, that 
when you start reading these kinds of hearings, I, have, I came into possession of many of these hearings in recent years from the historian and journalist Stanton Evans, who passed away last year. And I just pick them up and I, I read these things like a Communist Party defector testifying, just randomly, you pick it up, you start to read. He's testifying in the late 1940s that when he left, he was actually expelled and beaten pretty severely when he limp, limped away. He, he tells the congressman, I was helping to move 500 New York teachers underground. In, in other words, away from their open affiliation with the Communist Party so that they could bore from within. I mean, the 500 New York teachers, I mean, you start thinking, wait a minute, where did I, where, how did I miss this? And then you find out that these hearings uncovered so much of this and somehow we lost this touch with this history. Another example, 1940, there were, 1941, during the Nazi-Soviet pact, when you could actually be um, uh, uh, critical of communism, we were not allies with the Soviet Union yet, there was a fantastic set of hearings in New York State, the RAP coup dirt hearings, or coup d'air, I'm not sure. They uncovered the complete Bolshevization of the New York school system. I mean, it sounds kind of like fantastic language, but when you see what they actually were able to uncover, for example, 30 communist faculty members working in secret cells. These are not open, these are secret communists in Brooklyn College alone. Um, 54 faculty members in cells inside City College of New York. You start thinking, Julius Rosenberg, the famous atomic spy, graduated from CCNY in 1939. Well, what was going on there? There were as many as, say, dozens of faculty members involved. Were they talent spotting? Were they assist? How was this happening? We're never, we don't know this from what we read about this period. Um, my first boss was uh, Irving Kristol, uh, uh, the famous writer and, and, and thinker, neo, known as the godfather of neoconservatism back in the 80s. And he's a very famous ex-communist. He was a Trotskyist. And I actually went back, he went to CCNY. And I went back to a memoir he wrote about his time at CCNY, and I was hoping to learn about, oh my gosh, this hub. Nothing. There's nothing about it. He mentions that Julius Rosenberg was in the Stalinist alcove, and he was in the Trotskyist alcove, and that's really it. it it's, it's a frustrating thing to try to go back to, but yet this, these hearings are there. Um, the information is there if we look for it. This is why the House on American Activities Committee opened to look at ideological subversion in 1938. They were looking at the Nazi Bund. There wasn't that much. And they were looking at the communist infiltration. There was lots. And this is why. And, and you know, so we, we learn about these things in isolation. We don't understand. Um, even going back to 1930, they were starting to do this. Hamilton Fish had the first congressional hearings. But even as early as 19... It's 1920. There were hearings again in New York State as the point of entry for so much immigration. And they were finding in the schools all manner of communist socialist books. Um, the Bolsheviki and World Peace by Trotsky were in many schools. A book called Anarchism and Free Love, which again sort of brings us up to the Frankfurt idea of the sexual revolution in the 60s. We're already dealing with this back in 1920. Um, this is this is kind of the um, understanding that I think becomes very, very important to try to deal with not just political correctness, which I think we've sort of gotten rid of as, as at least the main idea of how we think about these things, but the kind of subversion that ideological, hostile ideologies bring to this country. Once upon a time, people understood this and they actually made ideological subversion a um, point at which you could deny entry among immigrants. If somebody's ideological outlook was hostile to our country, wanted to overthrow our constitution, they could be excluded. We still have that on the books, if I'm not mistaken. And this is kind of where you get to, a lot of people believe in terms of arguing about whether Islamic immigration is, is, is excludable, you get to the ideological piece of it and you see that it's under the same rubric. If we ever get to a point breaking through the political correctness of actually seizing that tiger by the tail and trying to have a rational debate about it and see what it is that we the people want to do and, and have our, our elected officials do. So in closing, I would just like to say again how much I thank everyone for coming out because I think, I think that with all of the hoopla around this talk tonight, I think that we should all congratulate ourselves for being here because it is a win 
and it's a win against this whole political correctness. So I thank you very much for your kind attention.